In a previous video, I built up this little blinking jewel thief circuit, and I mentioned that I wanted to hook it up to an oscilloscope and probe around and see what exactly is going on in it. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, from the previous video, the circuit's been modified slightly, and I had some provisions on the circuit board to be able to do this, but there is an extra resistor in the circuit, which I'm using to measure battery current. So that's right here on the positive side of the battery. Right in this area, there is a one ohm resistor added into the circuit, and we're going to be measuring voltage across that guy. And of course, measuring voltage across a one ohm resistor is going to be equivalent to measuring the current through the one ohm resistor because of Ohm's law, V equals IR, so one volt across that resistor is going to be equivalent to one amp through that resistor. So that resistor is R1 on the circuit board, little tiny 0805 guy. And then the jumper underneath that is cut, and I've soldered a couple of wires onto that jumper so we can measure the voltage across it. One thing I do want to note is that usually hooking in like a 1 ohm resistor to a circuit like this won't affect it too much. But you'll notice the blink rate right now. And I have these two leads shorted together, so that 1 ohm resistor is effectively being shorted out. If I disconnect these leads, the blink rate goes up dramatically. I thought that was kind of intriguing. That was the first thing that I noticed when I uh, decided to put that resistor in. But I've done a little bit of probing with this guy already and the results have been pretty interesting. So let's go ahead and jump over to the oscilloscope. I figure the first thing we do is just measure the input current to this. So this is effectively just the current flowing from the batteries and the large capacitor on the back into this circuit. So I've just got the oscilloscope probes across that little, those two little jumper pads. So those jumper pads are just wired on the same pads as that uh, one ohm current shunt resistor that I put in there. So we're measuring current through the resistor right now. And if we focus on the oscilloscope screen, I apologize for just pointing the camera at the oscilloscope screen. I Truly don't really have a better way to do this. Technically, the scope is supposed to be able to be used with uh, computer software, but it, I, can, I can never figure out how to get it to work. So we're just pointing the camera at the screen and doing the best that we can. And what we can see here is this little spike that's, uh, well, really short, honestly. This is uh, 10 microseconds per division, so what, about 22 microseconds, at least at the peak, maybe 25, depending on where you're looking at. But what you'll notice is we have 100 millivolts per division. Now, mind you, we're using a one ohm current shunt resistor. So 100 millivolts is equivalent to 100 milliamps. So we are pushing roughly 400 milliamps in this little spike. And you can actually see a number down here is about 412, 408, 416, somewhere in there. Just, just a little bit over 400 milliamps, which is kind of crazy. I had no idea that it was going to be all that high. So let's go ahead and throw some cursors on the screen real quick here too. Um, if we bring these guys in, we can measure how long this pulse is. So if you're looking at the highest part of this pulse, we're getting about uh, 20, 23 microseconds, 23.6 microseconds or so. So really short little burst of energy there, but honestly a really high current. I was not expecting it to be that much. And assuming our battery voltage slash capacitor voltage is about 1.5, we're pushing about 600 milliwatts into the circuit when it's when it's uh, on like that or when the, when the transistor switches on. Now, of course, if we were to zoom out a bit, let me go ahead and turn the cursors back off so you don't have to see Actually, we'll leave the cursors on for now. But if we uh, bring our time base up a bit, you'll notice that these pulses are very few and far between, and the scope's going to start missing them here. Uh, one way around that, if we go into the acquire menu of the scope and we set it to peak detect, it's going to start picking up a whole bunch of noise, but we'll see the little spikes in between the noise here, which is nice. And if we move... Go back into the cursor menu here. Go ahead and move that to about there. And we can see that 
our pulses are roughly uh, 280 milliseconds apart, so we're flashing at a rate of about 3.5 hertz. And really, the LED flashing three times a second seems pretty reasonable. I think the camera's probably struggling to pick up every flash because it's such a brief amount of time, but uh, anyway, it seems flashing at three hertz seems pretty reasonable. So anyway, that's what our input current waveform looks like. If we keep this same sort of setup and we probe across the giant capacitor in the back, let's see what we end up with. All right, so this is more of a simple experiment than anything. This is the voltage across the big capacitor on the back of the board. So this is effectively the supply voltage for it. And you can see it's really not doing much of anything as far as I can tell. I was kind of expecting to see a big voltage dip here, just given that we were drawing 400 milliamps. And we're at, what, 500 millivolts per division, so our battery voltage, as you can see, it's roughly around 1.6. But one little trick we can do is go into AC coupling mode. And this will allow us to see in a little bit more detail what's going on, because we can make the scope way more sensitive in AC coupling mode. And theoretically, the voltage should dip down every once in a while. There we go. If we get the trigger level just right, you can kind of see that. This little spike here will be when the circuit turns on or when the transistor turns on. So right there is a 400 milliamp pulse out of the circuit. And you can see we're really only dropping, let's see, this is 50 millivolts per division, so maybe about 100 millivolts while it's on, and then it slowly recovers as the batteries recharge the capacitors. But anyway, you can see how it turns on, voltage dips down, comes back up and then slowly starts to recharge the capacitor with the batteries, and then that just continues to cycle. And that honestly kind of just looks like noise, but That'll have a repetitive pattern to it. So we're not dropping too much voltage at all there. 50 millivolts, we're dropping from maybe 1.6 volts down to 1.55 or so. So the input voltage to this guy is pretty steady. All right, so now I've got the scope probe hooked up across the LED. So this is fairly characteristic of the Jewel Thief. And what's happening here is you'll see that you have battery voltage across the LED around 1.5 volts or so. This is at two volts per division. So battery voltage across the LED, the transistor turns on, and effectively you're shorting out the inductor at that point. So during this period, where the voltage is basically zero, you're charging the inductor up, and then when the transistor shuts back off, the inductor dumps its current in a really high voltage spike, and then it kind of decays as the inductor discharges, and then it eventually goes back to the battery voltage once the inductor charge has depleted. And one thing that's noteworthy about this is just how high of a voltage spike this is. Now, most of you probably know that the forward voltage of an LED is typically around three volts. And you'll see here that our Vmax is somewhere around seven, seven and a quarter, and we're at two volts per division. So two, four, six, yeah, it's about seven volts exactly as the, uh, the scope is measuring there. So this circuit is actually forcing about seven volts across the LED, which means that we're pushing a lot of current through it for just a very short amount of time. And another interesting thing that I can do is short the uh, that current shunt resistor out. So as I've said before, a couple times probably, that I have a uh, one ohm current shunt resistor, which affects the circuit more than you would think it would. So now I've just crossed the leads on that current shunt resistor. So now we don't have the, the extra resistance affecting the circuit. and you'll see this voltage spike has gotten even higher. We're at 10.6 volts now, which is kind of crazy to be putting that much voltage through an LED. Though that is kind of normal for a Jewel Thief circuit. You generally don't have a uh, very well controlled LED voltage and it will spike up like that. And of course, as you can see, the spike is really short. That's why we're not damaging the LED. We're at five microseconds per division. So um, the actual 10 volt peak there is only a maybe one microsecond, it's really short. But the entire duration the LED has current flowing through it is maybe 10, 11 microseconds. Now quite some time ago, I did a video on graphing the current through an LED going all the way up to about 10 volts across the LED. So if you wanna check that out, I'm not sure how good that video is. I filmed that a long time ago, so the quality may be 
pretty lackluster, though I'll probably say the same thing about this video in another three years. So anyway, there is one more thing that I would like to show you with this circuit. And I mentioned it in the build video that if you didn't add that big capacitor across it, it would not work very well at all. So what I'm going to do right now is remove the capacitor and show you what it does. And we'll probe a couple more things just for the fun of it. So let's go ahead and just remove this capacitor. Because as I said, it is more or less necessary for the circuit to function. You'll see it does still technically kind of sort of work without it. But if we go ahead and lift that guy up, you'll notice that the LED isn't really flashing anymore. It just kind of looks like it's on. It's just on really dimly. And we'll go ahead and unshort these leads, which won't make much of a difference right now. Unless, of course, I rip one off. But anyhow, let's go ahead and hook up the scope probe across the batteries again. And I'll show you what's going on here to make this happen. All right, so this, again, is the battery voltage. And you'll notice we're sitting somewhere around 1.6 volts while the circuit is off. And the battery voltage is dipping down to, well, about 1 volt, it looks like. We can go ahead and... So we're going to go ahead and add one more voltage measurement here. We're going to add V min to this. So we're going down to about 900 or so millivolts, 920, 940, somewhere in there, which honestly is a bit of a surprise to me. I was expecting that to go down much lower than that. I was expecting it to be dropping down to the 0 0.5, 0 0.6 region, uh, which 0.5 or so would be low enough to the point where the transistor wouldn't be able to operate properly. So this is interesting to me. The other thing that you're going to notice, actually is still quite a while between the peaks, but if we measure this, let's go ahead and see if this will measure frequency. So right now, instead of our LED flashing at approximately three hertz, our LED is flashing at something like 52 hertz, and it's around 50. So that's why the LED looks like it's on continuously. It's flashing at about 50 hertz instead of uh, the expected 2 to or 1 to 3 hertz. So that's why I've added the giant capacitor onto the back of this thing is to make this thing work a little bit more reliably. And one more quick little measurement here. With the capacitor still unhooked, this is what the LED voltage looks like. And you can see it's a lot more tame. Uh, our V max is only 3.7 or so instead of 10 and a half. So with this, it's probably a lot easier on the LED, but of course the batteries are going to drain a lot quicker because we're flashing this LED 50 times a second instead of one to three times a second. Now to be completely honest with you, I'm not really sure why having the high internal resistance of the batteries changes the way the circuit operates so drastically. I would have expected the blink rate to be set by the resistor and the capacitor in this circuit, not the resistance of the, uh, the batteries or the inline series resistor of the current shunt. But it seems to make a pretty big difference. I'm not entirely sure why it does, but it is interesting kind of seeing how some of this works. But anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed that little video. If you have any idea why this circuit behaves the way that it does, go ahead and leave that down in the comments. And I'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye.